Hey, this is Justin coming back with another update of my food forest. It's been in the ground for about three years now and things are growing pretty well, but there's a lot of updates that I want to share with everybody. Uh, when I did my previous videos, I did them because I had never, I had not seen many videos at that point that were food forest based in a climate that was uh, kind of subtropical temperate. We're in zone 7B, North Carolina, which is the Piedmont region and uh, I just haven't seen much stuff out there. I still haven't seen too much stuff out there but I figured it would be a good resource to share and a good place for people to leave comments and and give suggestions but also um, ask questions about growing food forest uh, type plants or uh, edible plants in a climate such as ours or such as mine. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna do a couple of little things. First I'm gonna show you uh, my greenhouse area where I kind of get plants prepped and I uh, before I put them into the ground and then I'm going to show you the actual food force the update after it's been in for about three years then I'll show you some of the annual garden stuff at the end if you have any questions don't hesitate to ask below all right so I just wanted to show everybody this area uh, this is an important area of my garden um, and my food forest because this is kind of where a lot of everything starts and where everything happens I do mix annuals and uh, perennials together in my food forest so there's you know I use these little greenhouses that are pretty cheap they're just an Amazon purchase but they've been holding up they usually last about two years and then the plastic on them needs replaced but I use them to get my annuals ready to go outside um, before I actually transplant them into the ground. Um, but also I do have perennials in this area. Um, I'm, I've kind of gotten a little bit obsessed with collecting, collecting fig trees. So you can tell I have a few different varieties of figs. And these are all things that we started from cutting a variety of figs. Um, so I'll just show you a few of these. Violette de Bordeaux, Black Mission figs, Smith figs. Uh, let's see, Colted on Gris, uh, Adriatic JH, Italian 258. Uh, Ronde de Bordeaux, just to name a few of the fig varieties. Um, I keep these in pots so I can move them around and I can put them in the greenhouses in the winter so that they last from year to year. Uh, a few of them have been around longer than others as you can tell by their size and um, the Breda figs that they're starting to show, on, show for me. Um, that's the first crop of the season. Um, if you're lucky enough to live in a warm enough climate, you will potentially be able to get that Breba. That's the first crop before the main crop of the figs. Um, as you can tell, there's a bunch of other stuff mixed in here. Random poppy flowers and foxglove flowers. These are all in pots. These are things that are waiting to go out into the ground. Uh, I believe the poppies are actually just in a planter back there. Those are not going anywhere. They do not transplant well. But let me explain a few other things that I have going in my nursery area pawpaw seedlings uh, these were started from seed and they're in tree pots I do not expect them to be something that gives me fruit immediately we have a small um, chunk of land that I may be moving to at some point in time and I'm gonna actually plant those in um, that property and maybe one or two here ultimately a cultivar will be grafted onto those because those are from wild uh, pawpaws another fig tree through here I've even got some mulberry trees in the background right here, more fig trees here. There's a loquat hidden in the background right here as well. So I've kind of become a little bit of a collector as well, being in sub subtropical temperate food forest region. Unfortunately, we are kind of right on the edge of being able to stick some of those things in the ground and feel confident. Um, you can definitely grow figs in the ground. You can see there's a little fig coming on there. You can definitely put figs in the ground if they become established. They will um, grow large, do well, and provide fruit. But some of these varieties are varieties that I'm not sure about, so I'm testing them out in pots first. Um, moving on to some other things. Most all of these plants right here were taken from cuttings. So um, I mentioned some of these plants that I have in my food forest at a on my previous video if you haven't seen that go ahead and check that out I'll try to put a link in the comments um, this is a Nanking cherry um, that's taken from cutting this was taken at the end of last season or actually I believe it was about this time last year you can see another taller one right here um, they're doing really well I think I probably stuck about 40 cuttings of those Nanking cherries and I think I got about 10 to go so about 25% rate which is okay um, 
other edible plants that I have through here. You can see this long dangling um, thing here. That's a hardy ki kiwi. Those root really easily. If you ever plan on multiplying plants, hardy kiwi is a great one to reproduce for free. Another great one to reproduce for free are these blackberries. These are thornless blackberries. I forget the variety that they are. A uh, little pawpaw tree through there. I believe this is a persimmon seed tree right there that was started from seed. Again, a lot of these things will have to be grafted at some point in time because they're not tested cultivars. They're just wild. Um, and even some mulberry trees here that I mentioned. Next, we're going to come over here. There's a mulberry tree. And I've got just kind of my fun stuff, my citrus, little things that I like to... Um, and an uh, olive tree, little things that I like to play around with, challenging the borders of the zone. Of course, the summer's heating up, so we're starting to get our little uh, slips for our sweet potatoes going there. And those will go into the garden at some point once it gets warm enough. It is May here, um, the end of May, so it is warm enough to plant those. But those sweet potatoes love heat, so we're going to make sure that we give them plenty of heat before we put them in the ground. Again, poppies starting to pop open and more fig varieties there. All right, so that's pretty much the nursery area, all of the figs, white, Marseille, a few other fig, colted on gris, if I didn't mention that one, a couple other fig varieties. Now, let's go over to the main food forest, and I'll give you a little bit of an update of what's going on over there. All right, so if you saw my last video, you saw my food forest, you can tell it looks a lot different than it looks right now. Um, we're going to actually go through the main food forest here. I'll uh, tell you what's happened in the last year since I did an update of the video. I'll tell you how it's going. There are some positives, there are some negatives, and I hope that I can help you out. Um, I, if you have any questions about anything that I say, do not hesitate to leave a comment. I'll definitely try to answer as many questions as I, as I can. Um, and I will try to um, be as detailed as I can about some of the cultivars. But I definitely do not remember the exact cultivar for some of the varieties that I have. And I do not remember the scientific nomenclature for a lot of the plants that we have. So if it's like prunus or whatever... If it's a cherry type thing, I'm just going to call it a cherry for what the, the common name is. And these are things that you should be able to look up on Google or, you know, online at some point in time. So coming up right out of the gate, I'm just going to show you this because this was a kind of a surprise for me. These bushes here, this little hedgerow, I envisioned it kind of growing together and filling in in a hedgerow form. Obviously, it didn't really do that. I had to replace that one because it died, this middle one. But these did grow together really well. If I had it my way, it would be a perfect row of these Nanking cherries. These are called Nanking cherries. And um, they make a tiny little cherry. And and honestly, I, I really like them. Um, my son and I sit out here and we eat them. And they taste just like a cherry, a sweet cherry. Um, they're really good. They do have a little pit on the inside. But... You know, just in terms of being able to get some fruit early on, this is only the third year of production, and um, or the only the third year of planting, and we're already getting fruit off of them, and probably more than we can eat. The birds get plenty of them. Um, but that's something that I wanted to share. I definitely recommend these Nanking cherries. A lot of videos that I saw didn't really recommend them. They said the fruit is small. It's not that great. I think the fruit is awesome. I think it's a perfect size for a snack. Yeah, there's a pit in it and you're digging out the pit or you're just spitting out the pit, but I don't really mind that at all. So I'm going to highly recommend the Nanking cherry. Um, moving on to some other things, some other plants, um, and just some landscaping details. You can tell that there's a lot of green, a lot more green than there was before. I mulched this heavily in my first year of planting, and there you can see a little bit of mulch up here, but not a lot. Obviously, you can tell that the weeds, in my case, Creeping Charlie, has really filled in, and it's virtually impossible to keep up with. I, I could get 100 yards of mulch every year and dump it on top, but I spend hours and hours and hours pulling it, and I just had to, at a certain point, embrace this ground cover and work with it. 
I have little areas that I scrape open or I work with to plant little things, whether it's like a little three sisters planting where there's some squashes and some corn or maybe some like sunflowers mixed in, which I think sometimes is referred to as the fourth sister if you ever um, have heard about that. You know, some just trying to be creative with the little spaces that I have. This, if, if this is a, if I, there's a pumpkin here or a gourd here of some sort, this will pretty much fill this area anyways. So, um, you know, an example of me mixing in annuals with, with perennials, but um, obviously the uh, Creeping Charlie has taken over. In areas where the Creeping Charlie has not taken over, I have, whether good or bad, had planted clover in my rows and I saw that and I mentioned it in my last video and I in my last video I did I actually referred to somebody who um, did it in in their area and it seemed to work well for them uh, clover it grows very very well in this area and it is definitely something to compete against it is not uh, just easy um, low maintenance it grows very very fast and I constantly have to weed eat it the positive side of it is, I suppose it's a nitrogen fixer, and whenever I cut it, it works like a chop and drop. So I can just put it around plants. I can use it to kind of compost as a green compost to uh, protect plants and to you know mulch stuff in without actually having to buy mulch every year. Uh, you can tell I have stuff interplanted in my little holes. I mentioned that I like to mix in annuals. Here's obviously a uh, tomato plant mixed in there. And uh, that has, you know, these are doing pretty well. Hopefully they, as the summer, you know, goes forward, they're able to compete out with the other plants that are in the area that are maybe not as desirable or food providing and that they do really well as the summer goes on, like I said. The other ground cover that I have that's really heavy is strawberries. If I had it my way, I would probably have the whole ground cover be strawberries. Um, it is a good place for animals to hide or for like mice or stuff to hide and eat and end up kind of digging up seeds or, or chewing plants, but it is a really good ground cover and obviously the side effect of having strawberries is a really nice thing. That, as far as just aesthetics go and as far as my biggest things, I would say that weed competition is a really tough thing in the food forest, in a temperate food forest. Because, and, and obviously that's dependent on your location a little bit more specifically. I just happened to move to a property when I bought this property that had a lot of invasives on it. Um, I'm all for planting unique exotic things, but uh, I think this is a scenario where the native plant people really have it figured out, not planting things that are too competitive and are going to com you know, compete out with the other plants. As you can tell here, there's a battle between strawberry plants and Creeping Charlie. If you have this on your property, this is called Creeping Charlie. This is something that you really, really want to avoid letting take over. It will go everywhere if you do. No amount of boxes and cardboard and mulch will hold it back. It will be, and obviously I'm doing this all chemical free, so that's gonna add another little level. It's May, so you can see that our strawberries, there's kind of some last blooms of strawberries coming through, and we'll probably get another little crop of these strawberries on these ever-bearing strawberry plants. Obviously you can go with June bearing, ever bearing. Um, cultivar wise, you're gonna have to make your own decision on what type of uh, strawberry you like. I think that it's very hard to pick the variety of strawberry that you want to grow just because you never really know if what the advertising is is the truth. Um, you're never gonna really know what the variety is unless you have a place near you, a nursery near you that lets you come and taste that variety before you buy it. Okay, I've kind of taken you around and that first part, that first maybe 10 minutes of the video, I really wanted to focus on talking about the kind of lessons that I've learned with those different different situations with the ground covers and the creeping charlie and weeds and competing with weeds. Um, next, I'm going to move forward and I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about the plants that are in this food forest and, you know, if I can get into some of the cultivars as well, um, we'll go from there. All right, so let's take another look here and let's go over, all right, let's go over here and let's check out this tree. So this tree, which needs pruned desperately, 
is an attempt at an open center prune for an apple tree, okay? I don't have a ton of apples because the temperate climate obviously is going to be a little bit warmer, or I guess the subtropical climate is going to be a little bit warmer, and you're going to want to watch out for those those chill hours that are required or the, the cooler hours that are required to um, produce fruit. None of my apple trees have flowered yet. This is year three. They're very healthy. The ones that are here are very healthy, but none of them have flowered. I have um, a pink lady apple. I have Arkansas black apple. I have Anna apple. I believe I have a golden delicious apple and maybe one, maybe a Fuji apple, one or two other varieties. I believe that's a Fuji apple right there. Um, or that's actually the Fuji apple right here. That's an Arkansas black apple right here. And that they have not flowered yet. Um, they're healthy, like I said, but the chill hours or the cold hours are just not here. Those are low chill or lower on the chill requirements as far as apples go, but um, no flower. So that's up to you. If you want to grow apples, it might take up some space and you might not get a lot of production in the first few years or when you have warmer years in a subtropical climate. Um, I have the space for it, so I am happily going to keep those in. And if I ever move or start another food forest, I will also include those. But I'm going to be doing a lot of research on southern apple varieties to make sure that I can find those cultivars that can handle the heat and can handle handle the warmer winters and still are going to fruit, okay? Um, I've got a couple plum varieties or plum uh, hybrid kind of type plants, pluots or pluaries. And this is year three. On this particular plant, I do had, I, or I did have some flowering. This one is the, I believe, the flavor punch for the, let me see really quickly. I've got another one over here. Yes, that's the flavor punch. I believe it's a pluary, and it flowered. And there is even one little fruit on this, which I'm sure will fall off at some point. Um, it's a fast growing tree I mean it's healthy it's doing really well otherwise I will prune it back a little bit to keep it down to size I keep everything on the smaller side so that I can handle it and so that they don't grow in on each other here's another cultivar this is the one I just mentioned or the one that I planted right next to it the flavor supreme pluot to help pollinate that had flowered really well but no fruit on it it could have been due to a later or a you know late ish season frost um, but no fruit so far. I've got a bubblegum plum here. That's doing really well. And I believe there's a Santa Rosa and neither of those have fruited yet. They did flower. So next year I'm thinking could be the year. Um, once again, while I'm here, I just want to point out some of the interplanted annuals like zinnias here to add a little bit of aesthetic. The garden used to have, or the food forest was a little bit more aesthetically pleasing last year with beautiful rows and um, beautiful, beautiful um, mulched pathways and stuff like that. That's just not happening. Um, let me move to a variety that I'm really happy with right now. And um, this is the Gumi Berry. And I believe it's the Tillamook. It was from One Green World. And I picked it because I watched a few videos. I think Ross Ratty, who's really known for his fig videos, recommended this. And there's, it goes by a couple different names, but I found it th searching high and low on One Green World. And it has these berries that are red, these Gumi berries, and they are really good. They're really juicy. They're soft. I can see where it gets its name like a gummy bear. It's squishy. It um, is a little bit astringent. And um, it's kind of like autumn olive. If you have an autumn olive, we have them growing invasively all over the place near our house. So I, we've tasted them and eaten them here. Kind of tastes like that. Maybe a little bit better, a little bit sweeter. And um, it's worth growing. You can tell the birds like it. The birds pick away at them. But there's plenty for us. And even though it's astringent, it's definitely worth growing. And it's a really good berry. I could eat these all day long. Really quickly, we do have persimmon trees, two right next to each other, that are of the Asian varieties, the non-astringent um, varieties. And this is flowering right now, so you can see the little flowers up there. So there's a possibility that we get fruit on this variety on the Fuyu this year. 
or the Ichijiro Kiki or Ichi Kiki Jiro, I always say it wrong. And uh, we'll keep an eye out for fruit on that. They, I would kind of say that this is like a little guild that I have planted here with this Gumi. Uh, supposedly the Gumi is nitrogen fixing. So I planted that between those two plants to help with growth there. And as you can tell, there are annuals mixed in with, I believe, cantaloupe here, which will grow all around the base and hopefully compete with the weeds that are in the area. I do like to, like I showed you the zinnia flowers, I do try to plant some natives and some flowers. Got some echinacea purple cone flower mixed in there. And I'm really happy that I did those because, you know, where there's a void, I would rather the seeds from that spill into and grow flowers than grow something that's invasive or grow another weed, which is just going to happen here. Um, the kind of my, my embarrassing part of my food forest is a section where I keep all of my cages that I used to have before I had a fence around all of my trees. And I'll just show everybody, you can all see nobody's perfect. Nobody has a perfect garden. I have black plastic, which I don't love. I would prefer not to have any plastic in a garden, obviously. Um, I've got metal fencing. It's, it's definitely not a beautiful section, but it did a really good job of helping some plants get established that I had a hard time competing with weeds no matter how much mulch I had. And um, I'm really happy with the result that I got. Now it's just time to clean up this black plastic and pick up all the tiny little pieces since it's been damaged. Um, if you can get your hands on, you know, a, a recycled billboard vinyl or something like that, that would probably be a lot better. Um, and just for maybe one growing season, one hot summer to kill a bunch of weeds in that area, then take that off then cardboard, then mulch it, you're going to have a little bit better luck holding back those weeds. Um, I do have a few pear trees, and I, I highly recommend growing pear trees. I just didn't think about planting as many as I probably should have early on. These did flower, and there's a couple fruits on them hidden in a couple different places. So it, we might get one or two fruits. They might fall off this year which is definitely a probability, high probability with when you only have one or two fruits on, don't count on them sticking around. Um, but if I prune this thing the right way, there's no reason why next year I shouldn't be able to get good fruit off of it, at least a handful of them, um, a good taste to know if I like the variety. The great thing about knowing if you like the variety is you can decide if you're gonna keep that plant. If you're gonna keep that plant, that's great. If you're not gonna keep that plant, don't dig it up, don't pull it out, just chop it and graft something different onto it or graft something on different onto it then come back later and chop it that way you can keep the root system and the plant going strong and not have to start from scratch i keep mentioning that tip because i just feel like it's super wasteful to dig out plants and this last year i learned how to do graft do some grafting and it's been a really cool process to see here's another pear tree that's not doing as well and it probably just needs to be trimmed up and it probably got hit with a little bit of disease but there's there are some pears on it, so if I take care of this thing and prune it the correct way this year, we should be able to get pretty quality fruit. Um, I would say if you're in a temperate climate and you want to get fruit, bigger fruits, like the more desirable, the ones that are more recognizable in a grocery store, your probably two or three go-to um, fruits are going to be pears. Those should, in theory, do really, really well around here. Um, and yes, I do need to prune down low around the base because those runners, those suckers are probably from the rootstock, not from the actual variety. But back to what I was saying, sorry if you can't hear me, there's an airplane flying by, but pears, number one. Number two would definitely be peaches. These peach trees are only two years old. Now, I mulch my trees. I don't feed them with anything, but... I do mulch them, or I did mulch them heavily. These, pe these peach trees are loaded. They are full of peaches. And I have already come through and probably picked off half of them just so the branches wouldn't snap. And so I wasn't, you know, if you get greedy, you're going to end up having branches snap and you're going to end up losing a whole tree and not getting any fruit. So you definitely want to um, thin fruit when these plants, trees are developing. Starting to get a little bit of ripening on some of these peaches. This one, like I said, is another one that I highly recommend. This is a red haven peach, and this is also a red haven peach. I prune these things every year since I put them in aggressively. 
in the winter I cut them down to about six feet tall you can pretty much see the little elbow in this tree where I had pruned almost the line where I had pruned stuff and I will probably let all the fruit finish on this and come back and chop it at about 10 feet high to keep this um, plant going. I prune everything in the temperate climate area to an open center because the open center is going to give the most airflow to the tree and is going to help with the productivity and is also going to help avoid disease and help with, like I said, airflow through the tree. Um, peaches, so peaches are number two. A um, little bit of a side note as we go over to the peaches, elderberries do really, really well in temperate climate. You can use the flowers for stuff. You can use the berries. We usually just mostly use the berries, harvest the berries, dry them, and make tea out of it, elderberry tea. You can make a lot of things, jam, all kinds of crazy things. This is another one that is very, very easy to root from cuttings. You can basically just pick a brown stem like this stem here, and you can see it has nodes all along it, right? Let's try to get it to focus here for you. All these nodes all along it will basically send roots out. So it, I planted most of mine by just take, taking a cutting. I did drip in, dip in a little rooting hormone, just sticking it in the ground when, when it was rainy and wet. And, you know, a year later we had new plants in those places where we did that. So, like I said you know kind of a side note from our three most important or three most successful plants i would say elderberries are probably also one you want to consider in a temperate climate and they've done really well in my food forest the third one that i really really recommend especially if you're in north carolina because of the soil that we have here being slightly acidic are blueberries this row here in this ugly black plastic are all blueberries coming across here um, these actually were transplanted. I had them in a different area with not very good sun, and I transplanted them early last spring, so about a year and a few months ago. And the plants are doing very, very well. I will need to prune them after they fruit this year and um, hedge them back a little bit, but most of them are loaded with fruit. Most of them have a ton of fruit on them and are doing very, very, very well we hope to get a good blueberry crop this year and things are looking good so far. In the next month, we should be picking blueberries and I think it will be a good crop. One of my favorites and definitely one that if you're in North Carolina, North Carolina and blueberries kind of go together really well with just the soil that we have, especially in the Piedmont, I know. And then out towards the mountains, they grow very well and out towards the ocean, I know people that grow them very well. So, more embarrassing part of the food forest, I'll just show you my feet, how thick the Creeping Charlie is. Very, very hard to compete with, but it's here and there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, I can mulch it as much as I want, but now that everybody's into growing a food forest, it's a lot harder than it was two or three years ago to get the mulch that I got. I think everybody's on a list somewhere to get, to get mulch. Um, as far as surprises go, things that have really kind of done better than I thought they would. Uh, raspberries are gonna be the number one surprise on that list. These are black raspberries, and they're doing very, very well in this food forest. We've been picking them already. We've gotten a lot of fruit from this plant, and you can tell that they're loaded right now. As the summer gets hotter, I'm sure this plant will take a beating, but as far as this year goes, we are gonna get a lot of crop out of it. The black raspberries are probably my favorite just because of flavor and they just seem to handle the heat for whatever reason for me better than the other varieties that I tried. Um, this is fairly close to my house, and but it is at the black back edge of the food forest, and blackberries, raspberries, they are gonna send out these runners, they're gonna send out these sprouts, and they're gonna take over an area. So be confident in your area when you pick a spot to plant them. Um, if I had my way, I would have a better spot further off that I would plant it, but this is where they are and this is what I've got, and I'm gonna just maintain them here and try to keep them from moving over to another row. Um, they are thorny, but they're not too bad, not nearly as bad as like a blackberry. Um, sea buckthorn, um, you can look up sea buckthorn, it's a little orange berry. Those have done okay around here, 
but they have a hard time competing with some of the other weeds and I have not had them fruit or flower yet. They, in theory, spread by spread fairly, fairly easily, but I guess in this area they just haven't done well. If you have a dedicated area to them, they may do better, but um, not in this climate. Not in this, and on my particular property, I should say. A few other little trees, uh, apricot tree, you know, I, we all try growing stuff out of desperation. We want to grow things that we want to have and that's I don't mind spending money on a tree that is may die if I baby it a little bit I'll do my best to keep it alive um, but I uh, I want to try to get apricots I don't <laughs> that's part of the gardener in us is wanting to grow stuff that maybe we shouldn't grow in an area maybe it's a little too hot here um, plenty of echinacea like I said purple coneflower I had garlic interplanted here I'd need to pull that out that's starting to get ready to be picked uh, burdock, which is a root, you can eat the root, and um, another peach tree here, another giant peach tree. Um, this variety is uh, another variety, I can't remember off the top of my head, let's see, it is a, this is a red haven actually as well, but this one hasn't fruited yet. So be careful what nurseries you get from. The other two trees that were loaded with fruit are just as old as this tree, and they are loaded down this is from a less reputable nursery maybe i won't even mention names but it hasn't fruited yet i believe it did flower though so it could have been kind of microclimate in my garden where it it maybe got some frost or something and killed off the blooms so to be decided a little bit on this still healthy has a nice strong trunk that y branch is going to need to come off so it doesn't split anything but otherwise doing pretty well more annuals interplanted in the garden another apple tree that is has not fruited fruited yet more garlic tomato plants a carrot from last season i forgot to pick uh, this is i believe coxcomb i forget the scientific nomenclature for that um, but you can look that one up for sure it's a medicinal plant it does have medicinal value to it um, I just like the colors and you know having some color in the garden as well to break up break up the area break up the kind of the design a little bit um, this is a pineapple guava and actually this is really cool I just noticed this right now as I'm filming it there is a pineapple guava flower now I do not have any other varieties cultivars so I doubt that we will be getting this pollinated I doubt that I will get fruit but pineapple guava is another surprise tree if you can get an, a tree established here's another bloom if you can get another tree established if you can get a tree established or a row of trees established there's absolutely a possibility that you could be getting fruit on this the JC Ralston Arboretum has a very healthy one and it's doing very, very well and, and you can see it if you go visit it in Raleigh. Um, but that's something that I recommend um, looking up the varieties and the cultivars and planting in your food forest. Just a planter here with a couple different uh, flowers to break up the edges and so we got some snapdragons. We've got more, this, these are Sunbell Crespedia, Crespedia, you can tell me how wrong I'm pronouncing it, it's a flower, it has not flowered yet, it has little yellow flowers. Um, this is from um, Baker Creek um, Seed Company or rareseeds.com, it's a peppermint stick flower, once again look up the name, that will come right up. Um, Holy Basil has self-seeded itself from last year, and we've got toothache plant with some flowers coming in here which I just grow because it's fun to chew the flower when you're, and have your uh, mouth go numb or kind of play a prank on your dad, I guess. Another peach tree, this is a contender peach tree. This was actually bought from like a hardware store, big hardware store, and the tree is very, very healthy. It has a very thick trunk here. This was planted about three years ago, so peach tree is doing very well. good. Another win for the peaches. Um, the, it had a ton of fruit on it and it's dropping a lot of fruit so there's not a lot of fruit I'm not sure if that's like plum curculio or some bug that's drilling them and getting them or not enough water from the earlier season or too much water from the last few days but that is definitely 
um, a tree that is doing well and in the future should do really well for us. Another win for peaches. And coming back to the back, we've got another peach tree loaded down. I have not thinned these. You can tell they have been, bugs have been getting them. That little white kind of sap you see dripping out of them is from a, I believe the plum curculio or one of the bugs that has drilled into it. And this is the Reliance peach, another healthy tree. Good, doing pretty well. Good. Um, one last plant that's doing really well. I mentioned it over in my nursery section, and that is the hardy kiwi. You can see I have it growing on this kind of trellis up top of my fence. You do need a male pollinator and a female variety. Um, I could see that fruiting or flowering at least in the next year or two just because it's so healthy. I feel that it is um, it handles this climate very, very well. And I'm very, very interested in tasting that fruit. Um, I love kiwis, and I know that these are supposed to be similar, but just without the fuzz. So we will see how that goes. Um, that's kind of closing out the good so far. I will say, leave with a couple little notes in the end here before I show you some of the annual food forest stuff, and then we'll go from there. Um, I've showed you my raspberries. Uh, I'll show you my blackberries. This is probably another big mistake that I made. I was very excited about these blackberries. These were the snowbank black or blackberries. These were the snowbank blackberries. I thought, how cool would it be to grow white blackberries as advertised? And the plant itself has done phenomenal. And it is debatable that there's some shade that's blocking some of the sunlight from this tree. But blackberries should be able to handle the edge and a little bit of shade. They still get plenty of sun. I should be getting nice, big, white blackberries from this. And the reality is, when it comes to the fruit, that's probably all I will get. Those little, two little dots, that one little dot, they probably taste great. Here's a, here's a really even better one. Probably would taste great, but it's not a very productive variety for me. Um, I'm sure someone grows them really well but mine have not done really well. So just take that into consideration there. Um, I definitely should not have planted blackberries here. They're, it's an area where I like to walk and they send shoots up everywhere. I knew better than that and I'm just here to warn you, again, put it way on the edge. If you've got a food forest area, don't put it in that. If you've got an area kind of on the edge of the woods, put it over there and you know, on the edge of your yard or something where you can maintain it easily or mow over the edges so you don't have it spreading somewhere. I think that having it like on the edge of the woods before your grass, in between your your grass and like your food forest or something like that if you have a grassy area is great because you can just come through and just mow anything that escapes with the mower instead of having to worry about getting into, um, you know, getting into other areas where you can't just ride a mower and you have to be a little more selective to cut it back and it's you're never going to beat it by cutting it back so these are established here and i just have to deal with it hopefully they produce fruit in the next year or two that's about it for the food forest here's a couple more annuals here and uh things that i have planted in amongst my food forest just thought i would show you all that again if you have any comments or questions don't hesitate to ask um i feel like i've researched and scanned through every little thing that's out there and I know that some stuff is popping up more recently but um, that I maybe have not seen, but I definitely feel like I've read just about everything from people who have had experience in that area, going to gardening meetings and, you know, mem member of the J.C. Ralston Arboretum meetings back pre before all the craziness went on in the world and uh, listened to a lot of different people and learned a lot before I started planting, but obviously still made many, many mistakes. So hopefully you can avoid some of those and hopefully you can um, have an awesome food forest based on what you pick and the cultivars that you pick. I will say one last tip that I get, will give everybody for food forest stuff, just looking back over at the food forest to the side here is, you can see there's a lot of space between all my fruit trees. I think in an area in this type of climate where it's really humid, You've got to leave space for your trees. I keep everything kind of, you know, on the smaller side. Um, 
I don't let my plants get too big except some of the peach trees that grow faster than I can prune it and I think that that lets a lot of air get through there and helps present, prevent disease and gives plenty of sunlight to them. Just think, you know, if you're in our, if you're in our hemisphere, the sun is going to be coming from the south. So plant your taller stuff on the north side of your food forest and your shorter stuff on the front side or the south side of your food forest so that the sun can kind of go over those particular plants in the front and get to the ones in the back that are taller. Um, especially in the winter if you've got stuff that are in the cooler seasons or later seasons whenever the sun is coming in a little bit lower. Give it a little bit more sunlight during the year. Um, we're going to walk over to the where I was just before at the uh, annual garden here really quickly and I'll show you kind of what I've got going on. This will just be a couple seconds and uh, we'll go from there. I do have horseradish and a couple other weird things growing in these beds so I use every little bed as best as I can. Um, but let's take a little bit of a better look at the food for or the at the uh, annual garden Okay, here's my annual garden. It's nothing crazy pretty similar to everybody else's annual garden We've got tomatoes planted here to the left my left we've got a row of um, some smaller a smaller variety of okra uh, that is a dwarf variety. It only grows a couple, maybe a foot, couple feet, but still gives plenty of fruit. We've got beans coming up in the background. We've got celery growing to the side up through here. We've got kohlrabi growing back here. We've got peas coming up. We actually have a little raised bed in front of the garden with squash and all kinds of other little things. Some chamomile flowers, we'll dry those out for tea. We've got some muscadine grapes. Grapes are a little bit tricky to grow in this area. The soil is a little bit moist and it's a little bit humid for them. Um, and I don't think if the soil drains quite fast enough. We've got a few pepper plants here, a few pepper plants over there, plenty of lettuce, plenty of beets in the background, more zucchini and yellow squash, more tomato plants up through that other side of that trellis. We've got the chickens in the background and that is pretty much it nothing too too crazy like i said i plant plenty of flowers in with everything but that's about it this is my garden this is my food forest this is my annual garden and vegetable garden i hope you all like the tour i hope you guys have questions for me if you do have any questions don't hesitate to ask i ask have learned that i need to ask more questions so i can learn faster and you know become more proficient at the things that I'm doing that took a long time for me to figure out. Um, if you like the video, please like it. If you want to see more videos, updates, or if you have more questions or you have anything that you'd like to see, please subscribe and I'll try to be putting out more content. I don't do a ton of videos, but when I do, they're pretty specific to uh, this topic and I try to make sure that they're relevant and things that are enjoyable to watch. Uh, Thank you for watching and uh, see you next time.